In fall of 2013, John Cortinas started his first semester as an MBA student at the Harvard Business School. Already in his early 20s, John was making six figures a year working as a petroleum engineer for Chevron. Do not ask me what a petroleum engineer does practically. I have no idea. I just know he was making a lot of money in his early 20s. And he applied for an executive training program through Chevron uh, that out of 1,000 applicants, he was one of three that was selected. And because of this program, after graduating with his MBA, he would be sent to work full-time overseas as an expat. And these overseas petroleum engineer for Chevron jobs would have doubled or tripled what he was already making. So on average, they make three hundred dollars to $400,000 a year. John was a Christian, so when he got to the Harvard Business School, he sought out a men's Bible study group. And that Bible study group would change his life forever. It's also at this Bible study that he met a guy by the name Greg Bomber. Now, all of these guys in this Bible study were part of the MBA program at Harvard Business School, and the odds were that each one of them, after graduating, would be making a lot of money. So this was a topic of discussion at their Bible study. How should we live as followers of Jesus, uh, and, and what should we do? What does this require of us after we graduate uh, with all this money? Well, Greg, John's friend that he met, he found out about this class over at the Harvard Divinity School called God and Money. And so him and John signed up to take this course, God and Money. And this course would take them on an in-depth journey through Scripture and even Christian history and theology about what God says about money. Neither John nor Greg were prepared for what they discovered. Both of them were raised in Christian homes, and John especially thought he had a pretty good handle on what a mature Christian, how a mature Christian should handle money. He was frugal. He really worked hard to save money. He was successful because of hard work, which is a pretty virtuous thing, right? And he tied 10% to his church, which, as far as he understood, that's what he needed to do. So from John's perspective, like, man, he is nailing it. He is hitting the target. Well, then John encountered, as they're going through this class, God and Money, and exploring Scripture, encountered the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, and it convicted him. The parable uh, is about uh, a wealthy man who has a such a bountiful harvest that he has a surplus. And so he builds bigger barns and bigger storehouses, and he stores up all his resources and all his stuff for himself. But then he dies prematurely and unexpectedly before he can use or enjoy all of this wealth that he's stored up. And in the parable, the man is said to be a fool because he stored up things for himself but was not rich towards God. This parable hit John and convicted him, and he felt that saving up and planning for the future was not inherently sinful, but making an idol out of it was. And he felt that that is just what he had done. He had made an idol out of building his network and planning to retire early and planning for his future and pursuing success and wealth, rooting his identity, like who he was and why he mattered in the world, was rooted in wealth building. And he had felt he had made an idol that he was not living in a way that was rich towards God. And the thing was, too, charity was a necessary obligation as a Christian. But he felt, before encountering this parable, that he was meeting the requirements of that obligation by giving 10%. Well, John and Greg, they ended up doing a research project together for this class, God and Money. And the research project entailed sending a survey to about 200 Christian business professionals who were making a decent income. It was an anonymous survey, uh, but it asked very direct questions, questions we don't typically ask over lunch, like, how much money do you make, what's your net worth, and how much money do you give away? When they got all the results, what they discovered was that most of these Christian business professionals, most of them believed giving 10% was a requirement 
for a Christian. But the results that they found intriguing and required more investigation was that there was about a quarter of the respondents who were just weird. They had a level of radical generosity that was bordering on the line of crazy. They had a quarter of the respondents who shared about how they intentionally limited their lifestyle so that they could be radically generous. And so they thought this was a pretty interesting thing, and so they tried to follow up. Because originally it's anonymous, so they sent something out to see, hey, we would like to talk to you. If you're willing to come out of anonymity, we would like to find out more about what this looks like for you. They met a lot of interesting people, and they, uh, one of the stories they encountered was there was a young couple who was pretty successful, and they lived in Southern California, and they had a young family, and they were a growing family, and they had been saving up to upgrade their home, to get kind of their dream home, or sometimes what we call uh, a forever home. And they'd been saving up. Again, God started convicting them and called them to a radical generosity. And what they ended up doing was that money they had been saving up, they wrote a check for $100,000 and gave it to the church and stayed in the home that they were already in. They met another guy. He was a hedge fund manager. Uh, he lived in Texas, and he was potentially making millions of dollars a year, which I can't wrap my mind around. But this guy, they talked to him, and this guy intentionally did not build his net worth. Now, he was uh, wise about how he used money. The reason, he said, they said, tell us about that. Why do you intentionally like not build your net worth and intentionally not save up a lot of money? And he said, well, I, from my understanding, Scripture is clear. Money can be really dangerous. Well, can be really dangerous to my soul. So I'm just going to not do that. He was wise, like I said. He paid off debts. Uh, he invested in college funds and really good life insurance policies. So if something happened to him, his family would be taken care of. And he did plan for retirement. But instead of doing it at an accelerated rate, uh, saving up for retirement as fast as he could so he could retire as early as he could, he just saved for retirement at a normal rate. And then he gave all of the extra, everything above what he needed, he gave it away. And he intentionally did not build his net worth. What they discovered in these conversations with these weird, radically generous people is that they were asking a fundamentally different question. They were not asking, as a Jesus follower, how much do I need to give? They were asking the question, how much do I need to keep? Which is a different question. John and Greg's research project ended up getting passed around and shared around with different people and it was eventually published as this book that you see on the screen, God and Money, How We Discovered True Riches at Harvard Business School. John and Greg would then graduate with their MBAs and both of them, though, would be caught up on this adventure of following God and living radically generous lives. And for uh, both of them, their story and their plan and their envisioned future kind of took a different route because their lives were forever changed by that semester spent in the class God and Money. Now, this morning, as you might have guessed, we are going to talk about money, which is everyone's favorite topic to talk about, especially in church. But here is my, here is my theory. It's Labor Day weekend. So all the people who are actually here this weekend, like you're the diehard, so you can handle talking about money, right? Like, hey, whoever's here, you guys can handle it. Certainly if you grew up in the church, but perhaps even if you didn't, you have heard about tithes and offerings. Once upon a time, we used, to, we used to pass an offering plate to take the tithes and offerings of the congregation. The word tithe, it comes from uh, a word that means tenth or ten percent. Now, growing up, I grew up in the church. And this is kind of the teaching that I had sort of absorbed about tithes and offerings, that tithe was 10% of your income, and you were supposed to give 10% of your income to, to God, back to God. And then offering, offering was anything above and beyond that 10%. Offering was extra. It was not part of the tithe. And so somewhere along the way, this is the teaching that I absorbed that basically went like this. Your tithes and offerings, 10% of your income, that needs to go to the local church that you are a part of, the church that you call, this is my church home. Then, your offering or anything above that, you should also give, and you can either give your offering to the church, or if there's other charitable uh, ministries or organizations that are doing kingdom work in the world, you can also give your offering to those things. 
for your tithe needs to go to your local church. When I was a kid, my parents taught me to tithe. When I was even in elementary school, I had a little piggy bank. And it was shaped like a building, kind of. And it had three sections. Anyone seen this piggy bank? Uh, there's one section that said uh, save. There's one section for spend. And then one section for the church. And so even when I was getting allowance, I was supposed to put money in the section for the church and save and spend and learn how to budget money at a young age. But some of you maybe have gotten to know this about me as, as your pastor at this point, but as I got older, I'm a very inquisitive person. And I like to investigate. And it's not because I want to question what I was taught, uh, what people tell me. It's actually because I want to know deeply, like, why do I believe what I say I believe? And so I try to investigate, and what I've wrestled with and what I've asked as I come to the Scriptures is the question I was actually asked not too long ago, and that is, do Christians really need to give a tithe? Does the Bible teach, does it really teach that as Christians we're supposed to tithe? So we're going to look at that this morning, and I want to encourage you and invite you to stay really engaged because the answer might surprise you. At least the answer I believe uh, I have come to conclude. So you guys ready? It's going to be fun. So the word tithe, as I've already mentioned, it means a tenth part or ten percent. And it comes from the Old Testament book of the law. So God had prescribed very specific requirements for the nation of Israel for how they were to contribute to the worship life of God's people. And so the Old Testament, specifically the, the, the Torah, the first five books, this is Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, prescribe very specific requirements for how God's people were to live and how they were to, what they were to do with their generosity. So we're going to look at that. And what we find, actually, is there were three tithes. You may not have known this, because I actually didn't until recently. Maybe you did. But we're going to talk about those. So the first is what I'm calling the Levitical tithe. A tenth of the produce from their crops, herds, and flocks, was to be given, and this was to uh, support the priestly work of the Levites. The Levites, the tribe of Levi, they served in the worship practices of the nation of Israel, and the tribe of Levi did not have any other source of income or land ownership. So the tithe was the nation's contribution to the work of God through priestly service. And we find this in Leviticus 27 and Numbers 18. Leviticus 27, verses 30 through 32 say, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithes must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod, will be holy to the Lord. And then Numbers 18, 21 says, I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. So there was the Levitical tithe. This went, and for the most part, it helped support the priestly uh, work in the temple, and it helped support the livelihood of the, the tribe of Levi. But then there's another tithe. I'm calling this the festival tithe. Uh, the festival tithe, another tenth of the produce from the crops, flocks, and herds, was given to host a communal meal once a year. Uh, some sources say this is for the Feast of Tabernacles. Others say it was for one of the three. Uh, they're not maybe perhaps sure it could be any of the three. One of the three annual festivals that they were to have and host, this tithe went to help support. Or provide, it's kind of like a big massive carrier. Uh, and so, and they were to do it at Jerusalem. The cool thing about this one, though, was uh, that sometimes you may not know is the worshiper got to participate in it. So you were to bring a tenth of your crops or herds, flocks, some sort of animals for this communal celebration, but you were to participate. It was to have this big dinner, this big party for you, your whole family, which included uh, extended family and your servants, and you were supposed to include members from the tribe of Levi. And if you had so much stuff that it was hard, like you didn't live, they were supposed to do this in Jerusalem, but if traveling to Jerusalem was a challenge to bring all your stuff, you could sell it. And then with the money you made from it, once you get to Jerusalem, you can purchase the resources. And it was just something that they got to enjoy this big communal meal together. We see this in uh, Deuteronomy 14, which, I don't know if you can read that. 
a pretty small font up there, but I'm going to read it to you so you can listen. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. That place ended up in Jerusalem. So that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant for you, and you have been blessed by the Lord your God, and cannot carry your tithe, because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver, and take the silver with you, and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Yes, other fermented drink, this is going to be a party. Then you, we'll talk about that in another sermon maybe, but it's just saying it's right there. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. So they're supposed to invite Levites to come over. So it's like a big, massive carry-in holiday celebration, Thanksgiving type of meal. But they were to set aside get their income for the festival tithe. Then there's one more tithe. Called, uh, I'm calling this the benevolence tithe, or you can call it the charity tithe. Uh, they were to set aside every three years. So a tenth of their income and resources every three years, and this was to go as sort of the benevolence fund. This was to support, yes, the Levites and the poor, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow. We see this in Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your town so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows, who live in your towns, may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So here's the thing. The Old Testament idea of tithing actually involved more than just a flat 10%. Scholars debate on whether the uh, benevolence tithe was a part of the festival tithe every three years. So every three years on the third year, the festival tithe was the benevolence tithe, or whether it was separate. But here's the thing, if you're doing the math, I know I have some math people in here. Either way, they were to give between 20 and 23.5% of their income to support the work of the priests in worship of God and for hosting hospitable uh, parties and for being charitable and benevolent and helping the poor, the fatherless, the widow, and the foreign. So, what about the question about whether Christians are to give the tithe? Also, actually, I forgot, they also were encouraged or called to give offerings. And there could be Thanksgiving offering. They just wanted to thank God they could bring an offering or uh, to show repentance for sin, there were sacrificial offerings. So those were separate from this 20, 23.5% tithe. But what about us today? Do Christians need to give a tithe? Uh, I've heard preachers use Malachi 3, 8, verses, uh, 3, 8 and 9. It reads this. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. So you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. So there you have it. God says you are robbing him if you do not tithe. And if we want to be real biblical, actually it's like 20%-ish. I need to be honest with you, though. Do Christians need the tithe. The problem is that these tithe commands were given to the nation of Israel uh, by God. And while some preachers might say uh, that the Bible says you are to tithe, and it would actually work in my favor to use this Malachi passage in that way too. Like my livelihood is provided by the financial partnerships of people who support LifePoint Church as a nonprofit organization. So while it would actually work in my favor to say, yes, Malachi says you are robbing God if you don't tithe, I need to be intellectually honest with you, and I will tell you there are pastors who might disagree with me, but this is just where I've come. My conviction, the honest truth is, is I do not think we can apply these Old Testament commands to New Testament Jesus followers. Uh, because, if I'm to be honest, I think we need to be careful how we select Old Testament things and try to apply them to today. Sometimes it's, there's this inconsistent way of being selected, and I don't want to be inconsistent with you. So the truth is, 
I'm not going to tell you, unless I'm prepared to tell you that you can't eat bacon or shrimp, I don't think I can use these Old Testament scriptures to tell you that, yes, you have to give 10%. So unless you're ready to follow all 613 commands of the Torah, that's not what I'm going to tell you this morning. But we are going to talk about, but what does the New Testament say? In short, the New Testament never commands Jesus' followers to tithe. But don't worry, we're not off the hook. I know, you're getting worried. Some of you older people in the church, you know how, like, the finances of the church work. You're like, oh my goodness, the pastor's telling people not to tithe. What are we going to do? Well, there is actually this kingdom vision, this call to radical generosity in the New Testament for Jesus' followers. So Dr. Tim Mackey from the Bible Project stated, the earliest Christians did not practice tithing. But they were committed to extreme generosity within their church communities. So when the Spirit of God was poured out in Acts chapter 2, and people came to know Jesus and believe that Jesus was Savior and Lord of their lives, as they surrendered their lives over to Him, one of the ways their faith, one of the ways their expression of faith was lived out was through a radical generosity. And we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 45, it states, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Here it is. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So, new believers, they come to Jesus, and one of the ways the Spirit of God is changing their life is they're starting to say, hey, let's sell what we have so that we can help people who have little. And they're selling their possessions to give to anyone who has need. Fast forward to Acts chapter 11. We're not going to go there, but fast forward to Acts chapter 11. There's this believer, uh, this Christian by the name of Agabus, which is a fun name to say, Agabus, uh, who has this sort of this prophetic vision that there is going to be a famine that's going to affect the region of Judea under the reign of Emperor Claudius. And the Jewish historian Josephus, in fact, does tell us that a famine affected the region of Judea between 44 and 48 A.D. So in an effort to support the believers in the region of Judea at Jerusalem who were affected by this famine, Paul rallied all these Gentile churches that he had connections with to take up an offering, to take up a collection. And Paul was really passionate about this. He references it in a number of his uh, letters. And part of his passion was he saw this as a way to unify the Gentile and Jewish church. He's like, man, if we show how, how unified and how much we care for one another uh, in this tangible way, man, how, how glorified would God be through our unity? Specifically, uh, Paul has significant sections in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians that I want to look at. So this morning, while I don't think I can appeal to the Old Testament and say, hey, God says tithe. So if you're not tithing, you will start doing that. While I can't do that, I do think we can anchor some principles, we can draw some principles out of Paul's uh, admonitions to the church at Corinth this morning. So I want to look at that. If you have Bibles or devices, uh, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, there's also Bibles in the pews there if you want to go there, or you can just listen if you're a good listener, which you are, of course. So we're going to look at Paul's admonitions, uh, what Paul encourages the believers at Corinth. And we're going to look first at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So, here he's referencing the believers at Galatia. Verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. So that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send, with, send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go, also they will accompany me. So here he is, he's referencing this collection. He's giving them just real practical instructions. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Also, if you want to like really weave together the, the holistic picture, 
Paul talks about it in chapter 8, but we're not going to read all of chapter 8 and 9. Um, but he references uh, this collection in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. But we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Your righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. All right. I want to draw some real practical principles uh, from these two sections of Scripture. So, I think from here we can see giving should be, first of all, regular. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, it says, on the first day of every week. For the Jesus follower, giving, like this posture, a posture of generosity, giving is just something that should be a regular part of our life. It should also be individual. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, for each one of you. Now, Paul is taking up a collection from the whole church. It's the community's offering or gift for the Jerusalem church, but the community is made up from each individual. And so the gift is provided by each one. It should also be planned. Paul says, you should set aside a sum of money. Giving is something we should do intentionally. We should plan to set aside a sum of money. We should plan to be generous in the same way that we should plan to pay our bills and budget to pay our bills. This is another really key part, though, that I think is really helpful that Paul says. It should also be proportionate. Paul says, in keeping with your income, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. We go to that. Yeah, there it is. Proportionate. Keeping with your income. Paul says that what we give should be proportionate to our income. In uh, 2 Corinthians 8, in chapter 8, verses 11 through 12, he says that they are to give according to their means, not beyond what they have. So Paul's not saying, you know, give when you don't have anything to give or, or when you yourself are in need. Uh, you are the poor person in need of the benevolence. He says give in proportion with your income. It should also be generous. So 2 Corinthians 9. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Giving is meant to be the natural outflow of a generous heart. This is what I believe the New Testament kingdom vision is focused on. It's focused on a heart posture, not the letter of the law. And this is consistent with a lot of Jesus' teaching. You have heard it said, don't murder. That's the law. But I say to you, don't hate a person in your heart. You have heard it said, don't commit adultery, letter of the law. But I say to you, don't lust in your heart. You have heard it said, give 10%. But I say to you, have a generous heart posture. Generosity is meant to flow from a heart posture that's shaped by Jesus. It should also be voluntary. Paul says, each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is something we are to do because we want to, not because we're trying to obey some letter of the law. Obedience is valuable, but God is after your heart, not just your behavior. He's after who you are becoming. And we give, first of all, because it belongs to God anyways. The notion or the idea that it's mine because I earned it and I have some sort of control over it is a delusion. We God ultimately owns everything in the entire universe. It's already His. So we give in part just because it's not actually ours in the first place. But we also give because generosity is a response to the generous love of God and the generous grace of God through Jesus. Generosity is just like, it's part of the whole Jesus thing. A generous heart posture. 
generous with love, generous with forgiveness, generous with grace, generous with our resources, out of love for neighbor. It's just, it's just a part of the thing. It's part of the following Jesus. It's part of the kingdom. The kingdom is a generous place. And so generosity is a practical way to love your neighbor. Generosity, it's just one of the practical ways that we actually live out Jesus' command to love our neighbor. Scripture, you can look at James chapter 2 if you want a specific, but it's, it's really all throughout Scripture. It's abundantly clear that loving your neighbor, loving other people, it's not meant to just be this abstract feeling or spiritual thing of like, yeah, I love them. Scripture is clear that loving people should actually be expressed and show up in tangible, real ways where sometimes you meet people's felt needs. Like, loving people should actually, like, show up in action. So generosity is a practical way that we actually live that out. It's a practical way that we love our neighbor. Secondly, I would say that generosity is a practical way that we counteract the gravitational pull of materialism and consumerism. Jesus said that you cannot worship both God and money. And Paul wrote that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The plain reality is money, wealth, blessing, none of this is inherently bad. But Scripture does indicate it can can quickly pull you, though, into its orbit, and it can become an idol. It can become the thing that you revolve your life around. So Scripture is clear that one of the competing things for your affections, Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. Why did he not say something else? You cannot serve both God and your lust. And you cannot serve both God and food. You, no, he chose money. You cannot serve both God and money because that has the potential to steal your affections. And so generosity is like the spiritual discipline to counteract that. It's like the way we resist. The way we resist the pool of materialism and consumerism is we practice generosity. And that is a disciplined way a way to say, I don't want to be caught up in the materialism and the consumerism and greed, and I don't want to make an idol out of money and wealth and stuff. And then lastly, generosity is a way we can practically give God lordship over our lives. It's a practical way that we say, God, because here's the thing, money provides, like it is really important, it provides food, shelter, it provides what we need. So when we give God lordship, even over our pocketbook, it's a way of saying, God, you are Lord. I trust you to be Lord over all. Because I'm giving even, I'm giving you this. And so we surrender, and we also say, and God, I want my identity to be anchored in you, not in my net worth, not in my success, not in how much I make. Now, There's a real danger of developing a theology of prosperity here, too. But I think, also, I try to be as intellectually honest with you guys as possible. But I don't want to just gloss over what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Because he does talk about God blessing generosity. Now, this isn't some sort of prosperity thing that, hey, give, give money and you'll get a new car this week. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But I do want to look... Let's hear again what Paul says. Remember this. It's verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. So if you're stingy, well, you might reap sparsely. If you have a scarcity mindset, you might end up living with a scarcity reality. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Listen, I love this verse. Verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you know how many times he uses the word all? You will abound in every good work. Verse 10, who, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I think Paul does indicate 
God blesses generosity, but he says you will be enriched in every way, not so that you can uh, get the newest vehicle, not so you can uh, redo the kitchen or upgrade your house. Now, not all of those are always bad. If we can live with wisdom in that, and that's not inherently sinful. I'm just saying God enriches, he says, in every way, so that you are consistently positioned to be generous when the occasion allows. When there's opportunity, he will enrich you so that you can continue to be generous. So the question, does the Christian lose his tithe? I want to suggest to you it's the wrong question. The question is not, how much do you need to give to be good with God? I want to tell you something. If you're reconciled to God through Jesus, Jesus has already done everything needed for you to be good with God. That's not the issue that's on the table. The question is not, how much do I need to give to be good with God? The question is, what kind of heart posture do you want to have? Do you want for your heart posture, for your inner life, for your soul, to be shaped by the generous love of God? Do you want for your heart posture, for who you are in the depths of your being, who you really are, to look more and more like Jesus, or do you want to buy in to the consumerism and materialism and sort of the, the narrative of what the pursuit of happiness looks like for the average American? So the question is not, do we need to tie? The question is, who are we becoming? Are we looking more like Jesus? So I want to suggest to you, God is not interested in us simply obeying the letter of the law. God is interested in us having the sort of heart posture that prioritizes self-giving love over self-interested pursuits. Y'all still with me? Now, practically speaking, I want to share just personally some things that I do find helpful. I do find that the the idea of 10% is a helpful benchmark. And so I do personally find that, okay, I think if I set aside 10%, and I personally do think supporting the, the local congregation I'm part of is important, so we do that. And then I also think it's valuable if you're able to give an offering above and beyond that and support other ministries or missionaries or kingdom causes, uh, organizations in the world, and I think that is good and beneficial. And I obviously hope that you find it worthwhile to financially partner with LifePoint Church. But here's the thing. I am not going to appeal to Old Testament scriptures to try to tell you that that's what God is telling you to do. Rather, this is what I want for you. I want to encourage you, because my concern for you is to be formed into the image of Jesus. I want to encourage you, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus and seek for your heart and your soul to be generous. Cultivate generosity in your life. And, so, if practically speaking, making 10% the goal, maybe you're not there. So maybe you start at 1, 2, maybe 5, and you work up, maybe 10% is the goal. If that is practically helpful for you, then do that. But I am not going to tell you... uh, again, by appealing to certain selective scriptures in the Old Testament, that that's what you have to do. What I want to tell you is follow Jesus and seek to look like him in every aspect of your life. So have a generous heart posture. I want to invite the worship team up and have a couple of reflection questions that I want to share with you. We made it. That wasn't too bad, was it? All right. Some of you, that was either the least favorite sermon you ever heard on money or your favorite. Some of you are like, he said we didn't have to tithe. Others of you are like, he said I might have to give more than the tithe. Just listen to the Holy Spirit follow Jesus, okay? So reflection questions. Number one, what are some of the principles or truths about giving you have been taught to believe? And were any of them challenged by what you learned today? Number two, whether you have much or little in terms of financial resources, what are some ways you can cultivate a heart of generosity? That's the, that's the point. Not how much 
you do or do not have. It's what kind of heart posture do you have? Number three, if you have practiced generosity in your life, how have you experienced God's blessing and abundance as well? So do you think that's part of the story? If you've practiced generosity, have you seen God be faithful? Have you seen God bless that? Have you seen God show up? It's okay to tell those stories. It's okay to remember that and praise God for that.